All right, welcome to the September Family Partnership Council meeting. Uh, I'm Brooke Gill, your chairperson, so I'm excited to have you all here today. We have a good turnout. A lot of prep went into um, behind the scenes to get us ready for this meeting, and so I'm just really excited that we have three key initiatives from the Kentucky Department of Education presenting to us today, and they are seeking our feedback as family um, members and as folks that work in family facing organizations. So I hope you're ready to offer your opinions and thoughts because um, they need them. And that's really cool that we get to serve as a family voice on behalf of Kentucky. So thanks everybody for coming and for those tuning in via the media portal. For those members joining us remotely, ensure that your video is streaming. Um, that's new this time. Your video is streaming and that you're visible during the duration of the meeting. Your microphone should be muted when you're not speaking. However, all discussions must be broadcast to the public, so make certain your mic is unmuted when you do speak. I'm going to turn it over to Bridget Stacy for roll call. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Bridget Stacy, and I am the branch manager of the Community Engagement and Support Branch, and Leslie works in that branch. And she is actually on vacation this week, so I'm going to fill in for her. Uh, first, we'll do the roll call. Grace Absher. I'm here. Elizabeth Ashley Bruce. Here. Katara Catlett. Katara Catlett. Brooke Gill. Here. Melissa Goins. I am present. Oh, great. Tom Haggard. I'm here. Hi, Tom. Uh, Rhonda Logston. Natasha Lucas. Kelly, you're muted. Kelly's here in place of Rhonda. Okay here okay thank you uh lauren mitchell here jennifer travers skidmore um chris medley or kathy smiley kathy smiley here great thank you kathy uh, mona smith Julia Staten. And Angie Wright. OK, so that concludes the roll call for this meeting. Um, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to look over um, the meeting minutes from the previous council meeting. Uh, so we'll just give you a couple minutes to get that out and look at that. OK, so um, if everyone's ready, I need to get a motion to approve in a second. I'll make a motion, Lauren Mitchell. OK, I'll second it, Elizabeth Bruce. OK, great, thank you all and I'll toss it back over to Brooke. OK, thank you. Um, our first speaker today is Commissioner Glass to provide an update to us, and then we'll open the floor for feedback or questions for Dr. Glass. Thanks, Brooke, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to connect and see all of you. Um, I wanted to update you on just a couple of things that were happening across the state. Of course, we've started off school strong uh, with districts uh, beginning in August and September. We still have a few Eastern Kentucky districts that are working to get started again. Uh, those are the ones in Letcher County that uh, had, in addition to significant building damage, uh, they had uh, wastewater treatment damage to their community. And so we, we got some good news last week that it looked like they were going to be able to get that restored and get back online. And, and now uh, both Letcher County and Jenkins Independent have start dates planned a couple of weeks from now. So that's really encouraging news. Uh, I was down there last week. And if you could have seen that where they were at that point, it would have felt like a miracle would have been necessary to, for them to be talking about getting open uh, in a couple of weeks. But they've been working diligently to get open. Uh, and we're excited about them having that start 
start date set out in the future. Uh, the other Eastern Kentucky districts that were impacted by the floods are operating. Uh, they're operating in all sorts of configurations. Some of the buildings had relatively minor damage. Um, other buildings were quite extensive, uh, notably in uh, Perry County. Uh, they had one building that's destroyed and probably won't be able to be reused, and that's Robinson Elementary. And the other uh, K-12 building in Buckhorn uh, likely will be able to be uh, reopened, but it may be up to a year before they're able to get back into that building. So what they've done is they've moved both of those schools into a building that they closed down a few years ago. So they had lots of uh, renovation and painting and uh, cleaning and activity to get that building ready again, but they have all of the students in Perry County back in, in school now. Uh, other impacted communities included uh, Breathitt County had significant damage to their uh, high school campus, particularly their uh, career technical center and their career center. They've been able to move those students over to the uh, Lee's College campus as part of the Hazard Community Technical College System. And so we have really appreciative of the support that we got from uh, Hazard Community College uh, to make make that happen for the students in Breath of County and in Jenkins Independent. Um, other districts that were significantly impacted were Knott County. We were really worried about Knott County because their flooding happened at their comprehensive high school um, and Heinemann Elementary School. So we were really concerned about what the impact was going to be there. Fortunately, they didn't have any structural damage. So once they were able to mitigate the flood water damage and, and get that out, they were ready to get uh, reopened. Uh, we did hear from those districts today. We have a weekly, we call them a, a huddle call with them where they all check in and uh, see how they're doing. So other than the two school districts I mentioned that are in Letcher County, they're all open back up. And Letcher County, we're really thrilled that has a start date. I was really concerned that Letcher County may not have been able to open for several weeks um, or, or perhaps months in, in and into the future. So uh, that's that's turning out a lot better than we expected. Um, a couple of other updates to give you just here at the beginning of the uh, school year. We are seeing, uh, or I'm hearing reports from a lot of districts around uh, low attendance numbers. And so this is the first year in a couple of years that schools haven't been uh, using the attendance number going back to the 1819 school year during COVID. We froze attendance number, or we froze enrollment numbers at 1819 numbers just to create some stability uh, as we went through all the periods of remote learning and then start and stop and all the disruption that schools went through with that. And so this was the first year that they came off that and went back to using average daily attendance. So what they do is they count the number of students that are present in school every single day that the school district is in operation. And that's the number that the school district gets funded on. So it's a huge incentive for the district and the community and the kids to be in present in school. Uh, well, what we've seen here at the beginning of the school year is that COVID is still a major challenge. Uh, and so we're used to seeing typically 95, 96% attendance rates in districts in a normal year. That's that's where they would be. Um, I'm hearing reports that it's more like 90% in some communities where the COVID outbreaks have been significant. It's 70 to 80%. And so the superintendents um, and finance officers in those districts are really concerned because they're funding next year. If, they, if something doesn't change or some relief isn't provided, we'll be based on that. So funding for next year, you may see a drop of 5, 10, 15, 20 percent in funding just based on disruptions that we're seeing with COVID right now. So that's a significant challenge for us to think through. We'll need some help from the legislature uh, to solve that. In addition to the um, student disruptions, we're also seeing similar disruptions with staff illnesses. A lot of it, again, is uh, seems to be COVID related or those are the reports that we're getting, but also just other kind of seasonal um, uh, diseases that go around. We're getting uh, flu uh, pop up really early. We've heard from national disease experts that we should expect a really tough flu year. And um, uh, we were hoping for our first, I guess, quote unquote, undisrupted year of learning since 2019, 2020. Um, it still seems like it's we're struggling to get back to some sense of uh, normalcy, but we are working toward that. And we'll need some help on that attendance issue. <clears throat> I've talked uh, some about the Eastern Kentucky districts already, but um, I just want to say that I was really proud of the way those communities and the educators and the school systems uh, responded to uh, the flooding that happened. The school districts worked um, 
feverishly to try and get open, understanding that that sense of normalcy was really important for those families and communities. Uh, lots of support from the communities, from the families, for the schools as well. And of course, we had educators and students and families in addition to try and get the community back on its feet and the school back reopened. Many of them had experienced losses of their homes and property and relatives and neighbors um, as well. So um, that's just was compounding all of the challenges that we were seeing in, in Eastern Kentucky. But it was really, while it's overwhelming and, and the videos and pictures don't really do it justice, uh, if you live in that region or you visited there, you really get to see the extent of the devastation. Um, it's it's equally inspiring as it is as it is just distressing to see the damage that took place. It's equally inspiring to see the way the communities have pulled together to recover from this. And thank you to everybody who had some part in that. If you volunteered, if you live in that region and were a support to your school, if you sent money, if you sent supplies, anything like that, all that is incredibly appreciated. We're really grateful for the support of the governor and the legislature in this special session that they call to provide some immediate funding support and disaster recovery support to the Eastern Kentucky School Districts. I think it's going to help a lot in stabilizing them. Uh, they were uh, using their own general fund money to get those schools back open, re, uh, re-cleaned or, or cleaned up, reopened. Uh, but some of them had significant damages to electrical systems or ventilation systems or entire parking lots that were buckling. Uh, so some of these costs were significant. So it was affecting what we would call their liquidity, how much cash they had on hand. So you might imagine if you had a damage like this to your house uh, and you had to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars um, uh, supporting that, if you had that amount of cash saved away, which these districts did, you'd burn through that really quickly. Uh, so now they don't have any cushion. So the, one of the things that the legislature was able to do is provide them some funds to restore their liquidity or provide some cash back available to them. It makes them more stable and provide some funds for transportation, uh, for community events to bring people together, uh, and uh, some of the funding that they'll need for uh, flood mitigation and for damage repair. Um, shifting uh, gears to some of the things that we're working on at the department. Um, in after the legislative last legislative session, part of the work that we have to do is look at what past and if there are any regulatory changes that need to be made. So uh, how sort of school law works in Kentucky, sometimes the legislature can write into law exactly how things are going to operate and how things are going to happen. Sometimes they write a concept into law and then they tell the Kentucky Board of Education to go and write regulations that really provides more detail about how uh, some concept will work. Um, a couple of uh, politically contentious um, laws were passed last session that intersect with the work that the Kentucky Department of Education is doing. One of those related to who gets to make the decisions around the curricula that are used in school uh, for about the past 30 years, those decisions were made by uh, school-based decision-making councils made up of parents and teachers and the administrator at, at the school. So the school team and the parents at the school were the ones that are making those decisions. Uh, just in all this sort of fervor around critical race theory and who was making decisions around curricula, um, the legislature decided to move those powers from the site-based decision-making team to the superintendent and the school board. Uh, so the school board sets a policy around how curricular decisions are made uh, that can involve <clears throat> deferring those decisions to the superintendent. That's probably how uh, school districts will engage with this. This has been an issue that superintendents have been asking for for a long time. They, for many years, really since CARA happened, have been wanting control over the curriculum. And so they have it now uh, just uh, under all this um, all these questions that have come up around who's making decisions around curriculum. So now that's going to be school boards and superintendents. Uh, and the department has issued guidance to uh, school districts on how that uh, is it needs to operate just through the lens of the law. Um, the law talks about that the <clears throat> superintendent uh, should collaborate with parents and with uh, the site-based decision-making council on these decisions, but there's not a lot of clarity about what that means or what it looks like. So we've tried to provide our perspective on what 
collaboration might look like, but you're going to see a variety of different approaches to uh, what that collaboration might look like. But ultimately, the decisions now are are in the hands of the superintendents and school board uh, when it comes to uh, curricular uh, determinations. Um, another element of Senate Bill 1, so that was one part of Senate Bill 1. Another element of Senate Bill 1 that was sort of related to this same concept of critical race theory and fears about that uh, was the Teaching American Principles Act. Uh, the Teaching American Principles Act um, doesn't do what several other states did in response to this issue, which I really appreciate. Um, it doesn't uh, criminalize teaching. It doesn't create uh, fines or strip licenses of educators. We were really opposed to all of those um, elements uh, for a number of reasons from the Kentucky Department of Education. Uh, I objected to them strongly uh, uh, because, uh, for, well, for a number of reasons that were related to the teaching profession, but also I felt like the entire concept of censoring what schools could talk about or students could talk about in classrooms was profoundly un-American. Um, so I objected to it on that standpoint. So I'm glad that Kentucky ended up um, with the law that we have. I'm still not convinced that it was entirely necessary necessary, uh, but it doesn't go do what some of these other, um, uh, I would say, authoritarian uh, laws in some other states do. What the Teaching American Principles Act uh, fundamentally does is establishes a set of concepts or documents that students need to be exposed to in the course of their uh, education, and they include some concepts that are uh, built into the words and values that the Founding Fathers had. Uh, they include interactions with some of the documents that the Founding Fathers wrote. Uh, they go further to have students interact with some key court cases, for example, um, Plessy v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, uh, and then they go into some uh, more sort of political um, speeches or moments. Uh, for example, Ronald Reagan's A Time for Choosing speech. Uh, is included. So that's what the Teaching American Principles Act does. Again, I'm thankful that it's not it's not what you see in some other states. So on the Department of Education side, we're working right now to take all those documents and then weave them into our standards, thinking about when when is it developmentally appropriate for a student to engage with this concept? Uh, when is a student going to um, be uh, have the um, development to understand the concepts or background or story about why um, that law or that court case or that um, document came into being and then um, put that into our standards. So we're working on that right now. Uh, a couple of other regulations that we're working on. Uh, one is a change to how charter schools are authorized and approved uh, in the state. So uh, the legislature passed that law that um, makes another attempt at um, getting charter schools started in the state of Kentucky. Uh, one of the provisions relates to the transfer of funds from the school district to the charter school. Um, we have concerns around the constitutionality of that in Kentucky. So but the legislature has directed the Department of Education to put in place these rules. So we're going to do that with the Kentucky Board of Education. The board is really the one that passes the regulations, but we expect a lawsuit the second that we file these regulations. Somebody's going to sue the department uh, on the on a constitutional grounds. Uh, so and so we're ultimately going to have to look to the courts to determine was what the legislature put in place constitutional or not. The key constitutional question is around the local tax funds. Um, the Constitution um, has protected those local tax funds and put the authority of, of them over uh, in, in the hands of the local school board. So the con one of the constitutional questions is going to be, can the legislature tell the school board how to use, where to send those funds? And we'll have to have a court uh, resolve that. Um, the other um, politically contentious piece of legislation was around um, transgender athletes and how they can or can't participate. They can't participate uh, based on this uh, legislation uh, that passed through. They put to the Kentucky Department of Education and the Board of Education uh, the requirement to put in place regulations around that. So we're going to do that in accordance with what the law told us to do. Um, but there may be civil, federal civil rights issues that that creates. And so again, I think we're going to see what the instant that we uh, move forward with these regulations, we're probably going to have a lawsuit and we're going to have to look to the courts to sort out does um, 
barring transgender athletes from participating in uh, sports uh, violate their federal civil rights, we'll, we'll have to have a court d determine that. Um, so those are a, a few of the issues that uh, from the last legislative session that we're working on right now. Uh, shifting gears uh, away from the last legislative session and sort of thinking ahead to what I think are really more in more pressing matters uh, before our schools. We've gone through um, two and now going into three years of significant learning disruptions because of COVID. Um, and those aren't those haven't stopped yet. Uh, we saw the national release of what's called NAEP data, N-A-E-P. The NAEP data is national testing that happens in every state around the country. And what the NAEP data that was released a couple of weeks ago showed was really we slid back almost two decades in terms of academic achievement. So we had been making steady gains. It stagnated some over the past uh, eight years or so, but we really saw a slide back to where we were about the year 2000 in terms of academic progress as a nation. I fully expect that when Kentucky's uh, state-specific data comes out, we're going to see much the same story. Uh, we're going to see a, a, um, a, a not unexpected but um, discouraging uh, drop in, in student achievement on fundamental uh, literacy and numeracy. Um, and we've got, we're, it's going to take us a, a period of years to work our way out of and recover from that. So in my professional opinion, that needs to be the issue that is drawing our attention. That needs to be what we're working on. Uh, if you want to, if you want to get upset about something in education or you want to get motivated or approach something with urgency, let's work on that issue. Because uh, that is, in my professional judgment, a hell of a lot more impact and importance than some of these other things that we are spending our time uh, working on and talking about. So that needs to be um, a four, uh, four uh, front burner issue uh, for us. Um, related to that, uh, we are continu continuing to carry out our strategic uh, direction that's based on uh, what Kentuckians told us they wanted for the future of education. We call that effort United We Learn. Um, the United We Learn F, um, uh, strategic direction contains three main or big ideas that I think are also really important things for us to be working on. Um, those three big ideas are that we need to change the experiences that our students are having in a meaningful way that prepares them for the fast moving future that's um, uh, already here and that just keeps accelerating. Um, so change the experiences of students and make learning meaningful and authentic. That's that is uh, sort of big idea number one. Uh, the second big idea is to bring innovation and change when it comes to our assessment system. Uh, there was a real sense from Kentuckians that our system of tests and measures and uh, accountability on schools was a barrier to the kind of deep learning that they wanted to see happen for kids. And so we need to look at that assessment system and think about how we can involve the values of communities and some of these skills that we know are, are also um, uh, are arguably more important than just uh, what can be measured on a current standardized uh, test. Uh, and then uh, the last element uh, that was in United We Learn was to work in partnership and listen to people in our communities including parents, um, people that aren't um, don't have kids in our schools that are business uh, members and communities to work with our students and involve them significantly in decisions that are made going forward around the future of education. So those were the big ideas that were included in United We Learn. That forms for me the strategic direction and vision that I work on as commissioner, in addition to what I think is a really um, important uh, effort that we need to do around mitigating some of the loss that we've had in terms of academic learning over the past um, couple of years. Uh, one last point that I, I should have mentioned from the outset, and then I'll close with this and just see if any of you have any questions that you'd like to uh, go over. Um, here at the beginning of the school year, we've heard a lot about teacher shortages and not having enough uh, staff members. Um, that is happening here in Kentucky as well. It's particular, particularly a problem in rural areas. Um, we're seeing um, fewer applicants for teaching jobs. We're seeing fewer people go into teacher education programs. A couple of success stories with that. We've seen an increase in the number of candidates coming out of the University of Kentucky and Western Kentucky University. So two bright spots in there. But even there, they're telling me that they're having a hard time, even if they can get someone to complete the program to actually take a te teaching job. And so that all this all comes down to uh, funding and respect. Um, so there is work underway um, with uh, different 
um, education association groups in the state to think about solutions for this issue. The legislature is interested in doing some things to support this as well. But I think it's fundamentally going to come down to those two questions. How can we increase the funding just from a labor market perspective to make teaching a more attractive feel financially and consider how we can be um, uh, treat our educators with the respect um, that and professional dignity that they preserve. Both of those things have been a challenge for us in the state of Kentucky and in the nation over the past few years. And they're going to have to be things that we work on uh, going forward. Uh, with that, Brooke, I think I'll turn things back to you. I'm sorry I prattled on longer than I had hoped to, but uh, we had a lot to talk about, I guess, or I did. Absolutely. All right. Um, questions or feedback on Dr. Glass's uh, updates, and then we do have um, three members who uh, have specific updates for you and for the team. But I'll open the floor to anything in response to what Dr. Glass shared. Okay, Mona Smith. Uh, this is follow up to some of the yes. conversation we had during the last meeting. Go ahead, Mona. Right. Would you like me to start or would you like to introduce it a, a little bit more with family involvement or or how do you sure. want to go about that? Sure. Yeah. So in the last meeting, we brought up the um, the issue of family engagement and family partnership not being a big part of teacher pre-service and how could we increase the information that teachers are getting in their teacher prep program before they hit the classroom. Yes, and, and my suggestion was to use the Kentucky Teacher Internship Program to address this. And I've actually been a stay-at-home mom for 16 years now, so I know I've missed out on a lot of things and didn't actually realize that that program is not funded right now. Uh, I also became aware that though districts are instituting their own programs like this, or at least some of them, but I just know when I started teaching in 1998, that my teacher resource person was just a great asset to me and uh, just I know that she could discuss with me the importance of family involvement and that sort of thing. So I just think that would be a great opportunity to get new teachers to just be aware of how parental support and involvement is a key to students learning. And if you had that, that mentor teacher just guiding uh, a new teacher along in this, that that could be so beneficial. Yeah, I completely agree. I had a um, I had a positive experience in the KTIP program when I was a beginning uh, teacher myself. It was distressing when I returned to Kentucky and found that that program had been uh, defunded and eliminated. And we really don't have a system for induction for new teachers in the state right now. Uh, we have been relying on districts to pull that together uh, themselves, but what you'll get with that is a lot of variability. Some communities will be able to do that really well and others won't. Um, over the past couple of years, with our some of our federal COVID relief money, we have been able to put in place, at least temporarily, uh, restore the uh, KTIP models. Uh, we're putting um, about uh, $8 million into that. No, that's not right. Um, it's uh, about $6 million into that right now, pushing it uh, through our co-ops in partnership with our universities and teacher education programs in the state to try and put that back in place. But it's time limited. Uh, we've got a fuse burning on those federal funds. They'll run out uh, in September of 2023. So we're going to have to have a more sustainable solution if we want to restore KTIP and puts, put a concept like uh, working with parents and family engagement into that work. Mona, you might be frozen. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, I think you're. What about now? You're good. 
Okay. I had trouble joining the meeting, so I was like, what are we going to do now? But but at least uh, that did work out, so I apologize for that. No, I did. I hated to hear that the internship program, uh, again, was not funded because I do think new teachers need the support, and sometimes it's hard to go out and venture on your own and ask for support. And I also know that all teachers are so busy and, uh, you know, taking the extra time to help out the new one next door uh, would be easier if, if there was a program actually for it. So um, the only, in conclusion, again, I just thought that would be a, a good way to address the issue of, of, of young teachers, or sh maybe I should say new to the field teachers, uh, just look, family involvement is important. They, uh, increases test scores, relationships, all those good things, and um, would be a way to address it. Um, I got a text from someone listening on the media portal, so uh, I'll throw it out there. Um, just wondering if the Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness, what might be a space that we could include some family and partnership best practices, or if that's already happening? Yeah, well, I think it's a place that we could look at. I'm, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what the requirements are, but um, when it comes to um, the Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness and then the Education Professional Standards Board, uh, they control both the criteria for how you get a license in the state of Kentucky, and they control approval of programs uh, for how we train teachers in Kentucky. So both of those are places uh, where the EPSB uh, Education Professional Standards Board could exert some, some of their authority around making sure that um, uh, some work around um, working with families and what meaningful family engagement looks like. But off the top of my head, I think, um, I'm not sure, but I tell you what we could do is bring on uh, Dr. Byron Darnell, who supports the EPSB, uh, to talk some about that um, and hear more about your ideas. Awesome. Thank you. Did anyone else on the council want to build on the teacher conversation before we move on to Tom? I just want to make a quick comment about the K-TIP program. It's, it's really just a comment and only to build on what was said already. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. In two, 1997, 1998 is when I went through the K-TIP program. And it was extremely valuable for me as a new teacher. You know, not only to have the mentor of a, of a fellow teacher within the, the school, but also the principal within, you know, another school that worked with me and just having someone that I could go to and knowing that I had that dedicated time to be able to bounce ideas off and the friendship and the camaraderie, um, not only on a professional basis, but also on a friendship basis to sort of break down the highs and the lows of the profession and just to make sure I was on the right track and to to take the temperature of the profession uh, was was extremely valuable and and I'm a little bit dumbfounded to to hear that the KTIP program is is not happening and and that there is nothing in place right now uh, so I, I do think that that would be something that we should have an action plan in place for um, to to replace yeah excellent points and in this the scope of the whole state budget, the KTIP program is a rounding error, less than a rounding error, really. It's, this is not an expensive support to have in place for new teachers. Anyone else? I do wanna offer in the chat box, I'm putting a link to uh, a series that we're running through the Kentucky Collaborative for new teachers and pre-service teachers around family engagement, just to have something out there while we're working on some of the bigger system, some changes. So Mona, thank you very much for um, sharing that and for bringing it back to our attention. Um, Tom, I know you were dealing with COVID, so you were on the agenda, off the agenda. Do you feel comfortable and well enough to share today? I'm, I'm on the men, so I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I, I won't guarantee that I can't get through this conversation without coughing a time or two, so I apologize uh, for that in advance. 
Um, but really just a, a thank you for the opportunity to talk about um, an initiative that, that we're partnering with, with some of our national partners and trying to bring to Kentucky, um, Engage Every Student. Um, so Engage Every Student um, is an initiative that's been rolled out by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, we've signed on as, a, as an official ally here in Kentucky um, and also engaging with some of our national partners um, like the After School Alliance, the School Superintendents Association, uh, the National Summer Learning Association, National League of Cities, um, to really talk about the importance of high quality after school uh, and summer learning opportunities. Um, you know, Commissioner Glass mentioned, obviously, you know, everyone is still dealing with the learning disruptions that happened because of COVID. Um, and we really believe strongly that um, high quality out of school time learning uh, is a really key tool um, into helping remedy some of those learning disruptions. Um, and so really, I just wanted to kind of put this on everyone's radar, um, especially when we are trying to uh, support families and support communities. Um, we know uh, that high quality after school and summer learning programs are important, um, especially as parents continue uh, to go back to work uh, and work longer hours, go back to school. They need safe and supportive environments uh, for their children to go uh, after school and throughout the summer. Um, and so I uh, really just wanted to bring this up uh, to everyone's attention. We are going to be uh, launching um, a number of different partnerships uh, throughout the state, uh, with some of our state partners like uh, the Kentucky School Boards Association to really start talking about um, why we need more after school and summer learning opportunities for kids in Kentucky. Uh, we know from research that for every one student in Kentucky who is enrolled uh, in a program, there are four more waiting to get in. Um, and so we really want to see what kind of work we can do to bring uh, that number down and make a program available to every kid and every family who wants one uh, in their own community. So I'll drop a little bit more information um, in the chat, um, but just would also welcome uh, anyone who wants to engage uh, in this effort uh, to just please reach out um, and we'd be happy to partner. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Just a quick comment on that. Uh, the out of school um, after school, before school, evening, weekends, summer, all of these programs are so important right now. Uh, one of the things that we've heard in uh, just in the wake of the national NAEP results is how are we going to get more time with kids to help catch up on some of the losses that, that we've seen show up on, this, on the assessments. Um, and while our assessments don't capture everything that we know kids need and, that, and what's important in kids' lives, uh, they do measure basic literacy and numeracy, and we know that that's a foundational building block. So we're going we're gonna to have to find some ways to get some more time and support with kids and using some of this before school, after school, summer school, weekends, uh, all of these uh, uh, blocks of time can be ways that we get at that. So we're fortunate in Kentucky to have a nice network of different programs, but some communities, they're stronger than others. We're, we're also fortunate to have uh, the temporary infusion of those COVID relief funds to help us out, but I'm not sure that they're going to be uh, around long enough to really fully fund all the all that's going to be necessary to walk us out of that. But it's it's really important right now and a massive help uh, in in our recovery. All right, thank you all. Are there any questions from the group or additions? Okay. Melissa, update on Frisk. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so um, as most of you know, our Family Resource and Youth Services Centers focus on the non-academic barriers to learning. And um, because of that, we've had discussions for years and will continue for a long time to have discussions about PACES or ACEs. Um, the P is just positive, so it's positive and adverse childhood experiences. Um, so uh, in in response to ACEs, um, we talk a lot about protective factors. And um, so one of the things I just wanted to lift up, there's a whole lot going on in Frisk, but one of the things I wanted to lift up was our work with the Kentucky um, Strengthening Families um, Framework, or if you've heard of Strengthening Families or Family Thrive or Youth Thrive, um, this is uh, the protective factors that 
we adopt in Kentucky. And um, uh, not only do our FRISCs receive professional development around it, um, we've embedded it into our new coordinator orientation. So as FRISCs are coming on board, um, they're understanding the protective factors as kind of why we do what we do. And so as we look at our FRISC components, um, we go through the practice of tying those to protective factors um, so that they can truly see how they are moving the needle and just, and just you know, I think of it as a scale, right? A lot of times we can't take away the adverse experiences that kids come in with, um, but because we can't do that, we can load the other side, right, and balance that out. And so that's how we talk to our friends about protective factors and how important they are. Um, parent cafes are one way um, that we put protective factors into action. If you don't know about parent cafes, they're, they're so, um, they're very low cost, um, high impact, and in my opinion, I'm sure there's research to back that up, um, high impact activity. Uh, we use it sometimes with our grandparent support groups um, where we, we you know, um, ask grandparents to, you know, just sit around and, and talk through how you handle certain situations or who do you call um, in times of need? Do you have someone that you can call um, when things um, get a little stressful? Do you have a plan for that? Um, and uh, not only, you know, have we looped that into our, our professional development with the protective factors, and um, it's also embedded into several of our tools. When we're helping a, cent a center, um, there's, you know, almost 900 of them now. Uh, when we're helping a center assess their growth, we um, have embedded protective factors into those tools that we use so they can really look at what they're doing through the lens of how are we building protective factors in our families. Um, and um, there's one more thing. Oh, and oh, and we also received some PD. Thank you um, to uh, to Laura uh, Beard, who um, gave some PD to our Frisks over the summer at our conference around family friendly schools um, and that initiative there. So um, those are my updates. I'm happy to take questions. There's a, a, always so much going on. It's really hard for me to choose one or two things, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to share those things and um, get any questions. All right, thank you, Melissa. Parent cafes are one of my favorite tools for engaging families and helping families build their social network. Um, and they are low cost, no cost. And there's so much information about them online, but um, you could contact Family Resource Service Centers about parent cafes. Any parent um, on this council or those listening can just grab the tools offline and start a parent cafe in your school or in your community. And it's just a great way to lead something um, without having to be an expert on a certain subject or um, have you know power to change something on a systems level. It's just a great way to start engaging families in conversation. So thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Commissioner Glass. We appreciate the update and for answering our questions today. Thank you, Brooke. Thanks, everybody. All right, we're going to move into our first presenter, Dr. Fields, and she is going to show us the equity playbook that was just released by the Kentucky Department of Education, and they're seeking some of our feedback as families on um, these tools. Dr. Fields? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, yes, the equity playbook has just been released. We talked about it. Um, we have interest last year. We have 74 districts that are interested in using the equity playbook. Um, the equity playbook is a tool that we're using to give um, schools and districts coaching. It's a coaching uh, mechanism to help them look at five specific areas. And that is student achievement, utilizing of funding and resources, disproportionality relative to student discipline, culture and climate, and highly effective staff and high quality instruction resources for our schools. We know that it takes a village to ensure all of these components or pillars, we like to call them, are um, helping us get into the student level. And as the community engagement person, I am also a previous uh, Frisk. Uh, so I was excited to be a part of this meeting. Yes, I was a Frisk for five years. I love being a Frisk and I also uh, was a school counselor, school counselor on all three levels as well. So. Uh, I love having that information and that work um, in my toolkit when I do this job down. So it's important um, for us when we're implementing this playbook to really keep our community and our families involved. So we jumped at the opportunity to be able to come here today to get some feedback on how we could possibly um, 
bring our families more into the fold when it comes to the equity playbook. So we had some questions that we want to pose to this group to help. Hopefully you can give us some feedback on how we can better serve our students by utilizing our families. So I'll start with the first one and I have my handy dandy notebook that I take with me when I'm writing notes. I'll be writing notes, although this is recorded. I kind of like to write shorthand notes. Um, so we'll go with the first one. Um, what resources can the Family Partnership Council lift up that we can specifically add to our equity playbook library of resources if an educator asks for personalized coaching on family engagement? Because the equity playbook will give them coaching. And this is actually from one of our districts about family engagement. And I said, well, I'm actually going to be on a panel to talk to some folks that can help us with this. Dr. Fields, could you put the link that was on the slide goes to yes. a, a video, but I'm not yes. seeing a link. I will drop it in there in the chat right now. Okay. Okay, hold on. Just so we can all kind of see what the resource. So this playbook, while you're looking for that, yes. this playbook is for district and school leaders on yes. how to better engage families. Engage families looks at equity as a whole, um, and they utilize those five pillars and we look at those, but we want to ensure that family engagement is a part of that. So if they're looking at culture and climate in their school and they see that, you know, families just not a part of it. Um, so they want to know how can we uplift that pillar and get the families more involved in that in that area. So that's what the coaching will do. But it's always good to talk to the Family Partnership Council about their perspective and how can we tie that into what we're doing. So that's why I'm here today. But if you click on the link, it'll take you to um, our playbook um, website that talks about the playbook. It has a video. Um, I don't know if you want to show the video. It's like a three, two minute video to show about what the equity playbook is about and what we're doing. So it's up to you, but um, that will give you a better understanding of what the playbook is. And I will say the playbook is not a book. Uh, I know it's kind of a play on words, but it's not a book. It's actually a, um, a toolkit that we're using to help individualize coaching. We just call it a playbook. I'm just going to say, I can't find it. I'm on this page. Are you clicking on it? I'm the not. link that I dropped? I'm on your link, and there's overview, support from KDE, funding and contact information. But no, it should. Okay, let me, can you give me rights to share? Not, not I. I don't have the power. Oh, not you. Bridget okay. has power. Bridget has the power. And Megan has the power. Megan, Megan has the power. I'll give you the power. <laughs> Are you all seeing? Other members, are you? Did you find it? Okay. It's all you. It's all me. I have the power. Okay. You would think this like this should be quick because we've been in the virtual world for how long? But no, no. we flip between Google Meets, Teams, and Zooms, depending on who I'm working with. Um. Okay, great. Okay, so the question to the group then, you guys, is what um, during these coaching sessions, right? When yes. Folks are asking, um, how do I engage families better? What do we as families want them to know? Yes. Got it. Turning that over to the group. All right, I'm going to get us going, but I want you all to share too. I, what I hear most often from um, teachers, oh, Melissa unmuted. That means you're next, Melissa. I saw it. I caught you. Um, so uh, is conversation scripts. What does a conversation with a family look like? Um, and so um, welcoming phone call scripts have been really popular, um, but also what, is, what does it look like to have a difficult conversation? and um, show me a video of what that looks like or show me a script where I can kind of plug in my own words, but I have that 
um, as backup. So when we keep talking about family engagement as relationship building, the first kind of pushback we get from teachers is it makes me really nervous to think about having a conversation with a family. What do I say? Um, so I, I would recommend some of those conversation starters and scripts be in the playbook. Um, I was going to say, um, and I don't know, because I wasn't sure exactly what you're looking for, because um, in the question it said resources, and I was like, I don't know that I have resources, um, but what I will say is that um, we all know that relationship is super important. <laughs> so if the if the first contact with a family is not, there's a concern um, that I have, I think that is always super helpful. Um, or, you know, you're, if, if, you know, say, it goes both ways. I, I never want the first communication I have with a teacher uh, to be, to be that way either. So um, I, I don't know how you add that as a resource or, or maybe that's being covered, you know, but I think that's just something I just wanted to say. It sounds so basic, but it's just really important. Is it, it, does it go back to also what we were talking about in our last meeting where councils need guidance and coaching too? For example, uh, recruiting and retaining um, a diverse voice on our councils. You know, a lot of districts have to, by law, have a minority representative and going about um, getting one on the council can be very difficult and we don't have much guidance in a council as to how to go about doing that uh, fairly and with respect to everyone involved and just to get the point across that we're not doing this just for the law's sake, but we're doing it because that diverse voice on a council in a school is very important. Other ideas of, if you don't know of a specific resource, just a topic that you recommend is included. All right, I got talkers on here. I know I do. How do you recognize your families or your schools that are doing well with family engagement? You know, if there was something that school A was doing really well with family engagement and they're really good at and been equitable about it, meaning they're actually meeting the needs, the individual needs of every student, not just, you know, um, so if they're doing that, how are they doing that? And how are you? Um, I want to say coaching, if we could help coach more schools to do what school A is doing, what does that look like? What, one of the ways that we're, oh, go ahead. No. Oh, it was, it was me. I don't know if I heard this on, on one of our previous, I'm pretty sure I heard this here. Um, was it was it here that I heard that that they had put the note cards like in a cafeteria of every student and and all of all of the staff put like a, a dot if they if they knew the student or they knew of the student and they knew something of the student and then everyone was able to step back and look visually to see who knew each student and it gave a visual touch point to see who was really engaged with all of the students in the school to see how engaged really the staff was with all of the all of the mm -hmm. population. is that was that here that we had that conversation it was yep um that was an idea that came out of washington mm -hmm. county uh high school mm -hmm. um, and they're one of the family friendly certified schools and that was one way that they started to realize do we know our kiddos 
Yeah, so I think as we have this conversation that that's one way that we know, um, you know, that that's a very visual and um, tactile um, experiment and, and thing that can be done, you know, that's part of like an in-service day um, for the teachers um, to know how engaged that they may or may not be with the student population um, in their school. In well, answer to your question, Dr. Fields, um, I think a lot of it is uh, word of mouth. I know at KASC at our annual conference, we were hosting schools that were doing it well. They would be presenters at the conference. And so then you would take that information that you learned and take it back to your own district, your own community. And that is how me personally as a parent have heard about different um, programs that are implemented in other districts, just word of mouth. I've also learned from this council. So I think just getting the word out to various councils and um, I can't find the word at the moment. I went completely blank, but you know, other entities and organizations, there we go, other organizations that work in education and get the word out to those organizations so then their people can know and disseminate that information to their communities. Right, and I think to Lauren's point, like maybe through the KSBA Associate, you know, the Kentucky, the Kentucky School Board Association, um, you know, being able to present it at forums such as that, um, you know, being being able to, to have a forum there would be would be good. How are schools able to tap into this council here? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, just scheduling to present and ask questions of the council and we meet three times a year. OK. Um, council members are also OK with being emailed. So if they're saying we don't meet again until March. And so if um, there's something we could send around to council members for feedback, um, that that works too. OK. Dr. Fields, that was one of the things we discussed at length the past few months with this council was the information to help parents is out there, but parents don't know it. And how do we effectively communicate with them? And we talked with Dr. Glass about parent friendly newsletters from KDE, for example, because I'm a parent. I signed up for KDE newsletters and it was overwhelming because I was getting tons of emails a lot of it not pertinent to things that i can be helpful with but if it was condensed into something hey parents this is something directly related to you as a parent or as a council member and here's a summary of it and then you can deep dive into it if you wanted to later at the kde mm -hmm. website but we discussed that at our last meeting on how to do that because it is a struggle getting that information to the parents that need it mm -hmm. So I'm um, thinking about in considering the time and the structure that we put in place for both teachers and families in um, promoting that family engagement. Like when Brooke was mentioning earlier, how do I use like, you know, seven starters are very beneficial for teachers, but how do you really support them in implementing these great strategies to involve parents? So as a teacher, I'm thinking of I probably would need my administrators to provide the time where we could really do these intentional steps so that they happen. And then at the same time for parents, when um, we invite parents in schools, we open that communication and we see we try to establish these activities where we can highlight perhaps student work. So we bring them to our schools. And while we're there and thinking about the quantitative and qualitative data that we want to gather from parents while they're there, we're already providing the time and the structure perhaps that we gather that data from them since they're already there. And I'm just thinking almost of like a station teaching when we have parents are in schools, they go to different parts, they can be informed in one station and 
like perhaps some strategies that we're teaching our students so they can follow up at home and then another station where they can learn about, you know, fill out these forms to gather some data from them, but just bringing, providing those time and the structure to support both parents and educators. We discussed that. I took what we discussed at our last meeting to my own council meeting at my school, and I discussed with our principal about making a PD just for family engagement, especially for new to the building teachers or new to the district teachers so that they're they're not taking uh, personal time, but it's built into their PD or their lesson planning or something like that to where it's a part of, you know, that way the school is placing importance on it and making time for that PD specific to family engagement. I'll, li I'll lift up Dayton Independent School District in that way. Um, they have designated three of their days um, to family engagement PD. So 172 in class days for teachers and then the, the three extra days are designated to a family engagement PD. Barnes Point. What district you say? Dayton Independent. Northern Kentucky. We've also heard of when you think about the amount of time, sometimes that it goes into event planning, kind of giving teachers some of that time back and doing phone calls or letters home and building those relationships. Um, is that time better spent than um, some of the larger event planning that that a lot of schools do? That would be more personal, more individualized. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everyone's feedback. Um, on this topic. Because again, we go back to the concept of, you know, it's the village and we all need to be part of uplifting our Kentucky students. And we all are stakeholders in that. The teachers, the administrator, the bus drivers, us as family um, to ensure that they grow up and they'd be great. So thank you for the feedback. I'm looking forward to meeting with my team. Um, these upcoming days to discuss the feedback and how we can tie this into the equity playbook to help support our districts um, that have reached out and asked um, about family engagement, how to increase that in their their schools and their districts. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Fields. And we thank the, you. The last bullet I did want to make sure to plug the um, the family friendly school certificate. Mm -hmm. And there is a requirement in that family friendly certificate that you're ensuring equitable practices through your evaluation. And so how are you ensuring that you're reaching all families and that your programming isn't directed towards the families that um, kind of always come anyway? Um, but how are you thinking about you know, the harder to reach families, historically marginalized families, how are you tailoring your your work so that that all families are at the table? Um, so to me, that's a for your last bullet. It's a way that schools are being recognized for their family engagement and it's required that there's equity built in. Is it possible that I can get the names of the schools that actually have the family school certificates? I can and we um, there's 13 um, right. so far. It opened in March and it's um, the Kentucky Department of Education is using it as a marker for how we're improving our family and community engagement across the state. Um, so hoping to see those numbers climb as more schools are adopting family friendly practices. And I will put the link in the chat. Is box. there. Is there an incentive for a school to do that, Brooke? Not like being recognition. 
Okay, and is yeah. it an application or is it just once you see that those districts are doing it, you recognize them or how does that work? So it is an application. Um, I'm putting the, the main website here. Um, and there's a self-assessment that's been created based on um, the research of best practices and the 2007 missing piece of the proficiency puzzle. So it's an assessment process. Um, you do have to create a family engagement team, um, which we're encouraging if you already have an equity team in place. Strong family engagement is equitable uh, strategies for families and vice versa. If you're doing strong um, inclusion and equity in your school, you probably have strong family partnership. Um, and if you're doing family partnership right, then you should it should reflect equitable practices. So as folks are thinking about increasing the equity in their school, that's hand in hand with family partnership. They're not two different conversations. Um, so you you put a team together to do the assessment, and then once you reach a um, level three on your self assessment, um, then you start filling out the application. And 2022 applications close November 1st. This is the, the quick guide. Then I'll throw out the digital playbook. Brooke, do they always, is it always November 1st or that's just for this year? Like, do they open at a certain time and close at a certain time every year? Um, March 1st to November 1st was this year. We just made it a really long window um, because schools just needed that flexibility. Um, I'm not sure when the window will open next year, but um, November 1st is our close date so that we can announce all of the schools. Um, November is Kentucky Family Engagement Week, November 14th through the 18th. And last year we were able to get that proclamation from the governor to declare it um, Kentucky Family Engagement Education Week. So that was just a nice way to all join. It was really like an online social media, you know, frenzy of all of the cool things happening in family engagement. So that is the, the time to announce the family friendly schools. Dr. Fields, I'll throw out the digital playbook too. Okay. Um, I think it would be good for the digital playbook to talk to the equity playbook and vice versa so that if you land in either space, you can you get to the other one. OK. Saving these links so I can. I know. <laughs> A lot. Is there anything else for Dr. Fields and the equity work that her team's leading? This is great stuff. I'm really excited. And 74 district already already signed on. That's yes. a testament to the motivation and the buy-in from schools. We're definitely excited about it. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good day. All right, next up is Karen Dodd with Kentucky United We Women. Good afternoon. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. I am Karen Dodd. I'm the Chief Performance Officer at the Kentucky Department of Education. And I, I try to sit in on all of these meetings that you all have because I, I love to hear the things that you're talking about and um, any advice that you have for us to, to do things differently or do things better as we move forward. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the United We Learn vision. And before I get into this slide, I'm actually going to start with my, my ask because I want you to be thinking about this. And you don't have to go to that slide, but um, I want you to be thinking about this while I'm kind of giving you the backstory on it. So, what I'm going to be asking of you is how can members help spread the word about? Kentucky United, we learn our, that vision. And what are some other outlets for sharing the United We Learn Council membership application? And that's primarily what I want to talk to you all about today. But let me give you the backstory on it. So we started this work toward a new vision last spring, and it started with the commissioner's listening tour. 
we did uh, 13 virtual town halls, if you will, with the commissioner leading all of that. And the way it was run, it was set up as uh, empathy interviews. So we had uh, several facilitators and scribes all on these calls and just asking questions like, when is the last time you received feedback on your student? When was the last time you felt involved with your school? So those were questions that were kind of more geared toward families. Uh, but things like that. And so we weren't asking about specifically tell us about the grading system or tell us about the attendance requirements. We wanted to keep the questions about um, about individuals and about so that they could share with us the story. So what is working well? What did what did that interaction feel like for you? What could have been better about it? Um, what didn't you like about it? What did you like about it? Those kinds of things. And so that's what we call empathy interviewing, really getting to, to the heart of the matter. Then in the summer of last year, we put together a coalition. So it was the Kentucky Coalition for Advancing Education. And we had over, I think we can go to the next slide, uh, we had over 60 folks who were part of that coalition, and they took all of the data that we gathered from those town hall meetings. Uh, they also, the members themselves, went out and did some of their own empathy interviews. So maybe teachers that became part of the coalition interviewed other teachers or uh, we had students on the coalition. They may have interviewed other students or parents or teachers or other educators. So we really wanted to get as many of those empathy interviews as we possibly could. And then the coalition was able to put together what we were calling profiles. So what is the profile of a student? How are students feeling when it comes to getting feedback, when it comes to their learning environment. So all these different things that came out of those empathy interviews, we wanted to say, okay, what, what, is, what does a student really look like today? And of course, not all students are the same. So we ended up with multiple profiles for students, for parents, for community members, business leaders, legislators, uh, educators, teachers, principals, superintendents. So we took all of these, what we call the, the as is state, the current state, and then we asked them to say, okay, if we flipped this, if we could do things better in education, what would that look like? How could we flip these, some of these negative, not everything was negative, don't, don't get me wrong. We had some very positive things that came out of it. But the idea was that we wanted to be able to flip any of that negativity to what could we do differently and what would that parent feel, what would that profile look like if we did some something differently? How do we, in some cases, tweak the system, in other cases, overhaul the system? And so we came up with uh, a could-be state for all of these profiles. Then in the fall, we can go to the next slide, we moved on to the um, the statewide summit. So that was in November, and we invited everybody that was part of the coalition and really anybody who wanted to attend, but it was very Kentucky-centric as far as what we were trying to do. The coalition ended up putting together a report out of all of the work that they did. So you can actually go out and read the report and see all of those uh, current state profiles and the future state profiles. And we started, they started talking about what needs to happen to get from one to the other. And they put together a learning agenda. So at this summit in November, we shared that with everyone. Uh, and then we've been putting more and more information out there as we go further down the line of not only spreading the vision, but trying to make that vision a reality. And go on to the next slide. So where we are now is we are forming a council 
So this is going to be called the United We Learn Council. And we're looking for members to take to take that report and, and make it a reality. How do we get to the United We Learn vision and make that a reality? And Dr. Glass talked about it when he first got on here. Um, he talked about the three big ideas. So a vibrant learning experience for students, um, innovation, especially around assessments and accountability, and then community involvement. And that's where you all really come in as well. We want to have another council in place that is going to think deep about really around those three big ideas. And so the council will be broken out into three subcommittees, each of which will be focused on one of those three big ideas. So we've already started. We've sent out some invites. We want to make sure that we have uh, some continuity between the coalition that established or helped to establish this vision and the work that's going to happen as a result of it. So we've invited some of the folks that were part of the original coalition back to be in this council. We've also just sent out um, the application to, to different outlets. So our communications department has lots of different uh, groups that they are able to send big emails to and get to lots of different people. So we, we've done that. We'll be putting it in things like the uh, Kentucky Teacher, um, anywhere that we've got a Monday email, a Friday email. So all of these, all of our typical outlets will be places that we will be putting this application. Uh, but we really do want a very diverse group of people. We want voices at the table who aren't typically there. So some of the invites that went out did go to people who are typically at the table. We have partners like Pritchard Committee that we, we respect their voices. We want them at the table. Uh, we have regional co-ops that represent a lot of districts. So we want their voices at the table because they're hearing the good and the bad, right? So from there, we, we know that we need certain people at the table, but we also know that we need to hear from people that we don't typically hear from. And so we really want this application to get out far and wide so that we can have this really radical inclusion of, of folks across Kentucky to help us achieve this vision primarily of having a really vibrant learning experience for students. Uh, so, th so that's what we're looking for. Um, I'm gonna put in here, this is the uh, application, whoops. That's the application to the council. Um, but I'm, I'm looking your, for your feedback, and you can go to the next slide because it has those questions on the or the question that I originally asked on there. So how can members help us spread the word about the vision? And I guess my first question to you all is, have you heard about that vision? So before Dr. Glass got on and talked about it earlier, had you already heard of it or was that news to you? And you can feel free to put it in the chat if you don't want to speak up. It was news to me. Okay. Is there anybody who had heard about the United We Learn vision and, and kind of understood those, those three big ideas that we're talking about? All right, I'm I had assume the answer. I had, um, but only because I had had conversations with Brooke. Uh, I didn't know de much detail, though. OK. And I still haven't given you much detail. <laughs> I just gave you a little of the backstory. OK, so then. How do you all get your information about what's happening in education? Or how, how would you like to get information about what's happening in education?
members just want to unmute as a parent um, and a family voice for your region. How are you receiving information? Does it come from the school? Does it come from your regional co-op? Like, how do you get information? Or you can be like, I don't get any information. Well, I'm, oh, sorry, more. go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm fortunate um, my husband is on the local school board and he's also part of the KSBA. So he, and he's extremely involved. So <laughs> he, I get a lot of information from him. <laughs> okay. I'm kind of an anomaly. I don't know. Um, I don't like to answer this question because I get a lot of information because I volunteered to be on the board of directors for KASC because a teacher nominated me and I've also served on councils for 10 years. If I didn't, I'd have very little information and it would all come from the school system. Like we have started Parent Square this year, an app for disseminating information for the entire district. And that has improved communication, but I'd say most of the parents in our district don't have a whole, a lot of ideas about what's going on. Um, I rarely get contacted about my students because my kids are not in trouble. So, you know, that's kind of the MO of most schools. Don't contact them unless there's something wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I get it because I'm involved, but I don't know that most do. Sure. I think Grace is going to. And I'm a parent too, so I get that. Uh, both of my kids are are out of the K twelve system now, but I, I know I know that feeling, and I, I think for me, I felt very engaged when they were in elementary school. But I think as they go through school, it gets less and less. Partly because the kids don't want to tell you anything, but I, I think there's also this. Um, or at least for me, the feeling was, yeah, we want parent involvement, but on the other hand, your kid, it's time for them to grow up and, and do things on their own. And so they, they, they seem to pull back on, on information at the, at the schools. At least that was my experience. I don't know if others feel that way. I agree. I think Elizabeth, Elizabeth's got her hand up. I do. I was just going to say our district uses the Remind app and disseminates information um, school-wide to all parents through that. Um, our district does a really good job of that. Actually, they come up with a monthly newsletter that is also pushed out through that Remind app. I have that and download it and also have like Infinite Camp. You know, I, I feel like sometimes I get more communication than I want. Uh, but I think one of the things that um, I, I would guess is probably an issue school wide is making sure that parents um, access those resources, because I think most or every district my kids have ever been in school and have had something like that. But I know just from what the school disseminates, that it's always parents, you need to sign up for this. Parents, you need to sign up for this. Um, they've started doing it at orientation now. Um, they got us all signed up there, but um, reaching those families that may not be able to come to orientation or first school type things or may not get their parent portal account, I would say, you know, if you didn't have that or didn't have access to Remind or Infinite Campus, your information from the school system would be none unless your child's teacher or administrator called you. So, I feel well communicated with, but how the community at large, I think in our district, at least, it depends on whether you've uh, availed yourself of those resources. Yeah, that's a really good point. I know I'd forgotten about that. We had Remind in our district as well, and that was helpful. I think I always got survey requests through that. <laughs> I just want to add really quickly. Um, that I think a lot of times it depends on the principal. We had a principal change and communication has skyrocketed. So, and I and I have two middle schoolers. So I, I didn't experience, um, I guess the decrease in middle school, but um, because I have a new principal. So there's there's that, but also I think our principal does a great job of communicating, but, but I still didn't know about this. 
So I think there's the, the mm-hmm. communication that we receive is is super local, right? Like I can tell you when ball games are, I, like those kinds of things, and like and like policy changes, mm-hmm. and like they have a little section like what we're working on, like dismissal, and like the and I appreciate all of that, and I think our communication, I'd probably give it, you know, four stars right now, but um, I I didn't know about this, and I'm not sure that this would have been included in that because that's just not the vibe of the communication that I receive. So just wanted to say that. I don't know if you were asking how, you know, how would we like to receive something like this or or and I'm and I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I don't know if of self-selecting on some kind of like I'm interested in in you know more education policy stuff if districts had that option um and then they could send things to those parents that's something that you would opt into i guess with the, might be a problem um but i don't know that districts are are used to and i could be wrong i have you know my limited experience are used to sharing um like the united relearn report out with their parents so that's right that's all i have to add so if i have an idea yeah i i think I think you're absolutely right, and I, th- I would even venture to guess that a lot of principals probably haven't gotten it, and most of our communication is at the superintendent level, um, so I, it doesn't surprise me that you all haven't been hearing it from, from schools. I was, but, but, you, but I love that idea about maybe some, putting something out there about uh, if parents want to get news about education policy. That's, that's a really great idea. I see other hands. Um, I wondered, I wondered, Melissa, um, especially thinking about getting um, families, like I was thinking principals could nominate families to apply for this. I think that always comes with a lot of um, respect and families get excited about that versus seeing a blast out of an email. If, if the call was to principals to nominate a parent within their school building to apply to be on United We Learn, but then it made me think, I wonder if it's risk because they may have relationships with families that aren't the PTA president, you know, that kind of your your usual parent leaders. Yeah. So maybe. So yeah. Don't... Yeah. And so I didn't know if if Karen, if you wanted feedback around that yet, I didn't know if we were there yet, but I'm. I have some feedback around that, especially because you said you wanted to engage community members that maybe haven't been engaged before. And I would just like to offer that um, in a lot of school districts. Um, Frisks are kind of the de facto like community school connection. And so um, definitely um, having them in some level as part of this conversation. And then all of our frisks have advisory councils that are a third community, a third parent and a third school. And that's every center. So that's like 900 advisory councils across the state of community members that are already have their foot, like they're interested enough to say, I want to be on this advisory council. And so that might be a really good pool of people that may not be engaged other places. Um, You know, some of them might be engaged other places, but it's just a kind of a unique um, role to uh, to be on that advisory council. So that that could be an option as well. And I'm happy to have any conversations you'd like to have offline about any next steps related to that. Great. I love that. Um, I'm writing your name down, Melissa. I'm going to check with our communications folks to see if they have the distribution list for the frisks. Um, they do if not, not I'll but be I'm getting back in touch with you. They don't, but I do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I will say one thing that we're doing, y'all talked about parent or um, principals. So we did um, a kind of a, a random data draw on uh, just a, a distribution. I'm not saying this very well to get an equal distribution across the state of districts, I guess it's the best way to say it, or, or re- within regions. Um, and so we're sending uh, very direct emails to, I wanna say maybe three, three superintendents in each one of our regions. And then with from that, each principal is being told that we will be contacting principals in their district to try to get uh, a little bit more uh, participation. And then we're gonna be asking the principals to identify 
family members or community members. I think that was kind of in line with what somebody was saying, but we're trying to be real targeted to make sure that, um, because most of them, we've, we've done this before with, um, well, with the council, or I'm sorry, the, the coalition last year. And most of them were, were very responsive and we were able to get a good number of students, family members and, and community members based on, on that. So that is also in the works. I see Lauren has her hand up. I was going to say that um, one thing our district did that I thought was really smart was with the parent square, every parent was asked to join. Now, of course, there were lots that didn't, but then they took a day at the middle and high school level. I can't speak for the elementary. I have one in middle and one in high school. They actually had the students sign up for the app as well. So then they're getting all the information that they're wanting the parents to have. And, and so that reaches out to the parents who may not have signed up for the app. And I know a good friend of mine, that's how she found out about it. She, she called me was saying, my son is talking about this thing and I have no idea. I said, you need to get the app on your phone and you'll get the alerts. And um, people are starting to learn, oh, I get information a lot quicker through this than I would the email the emails that the district sends out or the one calls and we're trying to um, as a district do away with the one calls and this just be our form of communication across the district uh, but I thought that was a really smart way to get the ones that might not have signed up for it is having the students do it too during school they had them all make an account sign up for it and so then they were getting the app notifications as well that's great so is square is that like remind Yes, it's very similar. Simple. App. We okay. did remind. Um, we we had done remind for a while, but the parent square is a little more user friendly. It can handle the entire district. Um, there's still some kinks to be worked out of it, but so far I've been rather pleased with it, and it has been really nice to have it all in one place because. The middle school was using something different than the high school and so I was getting all kinds of notifications from different things and also teachers liked different things like class dojo remind email newsletter this makes it to where you're getting all your communication the same way from all the teachers which I really like yeah that sounds really nice all right any other other any other thoughts on either one of these questions? Will there be a nomination, like a way to nominate members? Because I was thinking since we have one parent from each of the educational cooperatives on this council, it might be a neat idea for each of us to nominate someone from our area. So Brooke, you should have gotten the invite. What we've done is for each one of our advisory groups, we sent an invite to the chairperson. So you should have received an invite um, to represent all of the folks that are on here. But that doesn't stop anybody else from applying. So you can, and that's what I, that's what I'm asking you all to do is either I just I put the application in the chat so you all can apply if you like or if you could share that out in, with any of any avenues that you have available to you, uh, that's that's the other way to get um, to get on there. I think that's I think that's wonderful. If you all could think of family leaders in your areas, either you or someone else that you know would really enjoy that opportunity to forward that invite along to them, that application. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. And thanks for the great ideas. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Our last but not least um, presenter is Sarah Snipes with the Local Laboratories of Learning. That Sarah, I haven't seen you on here yet. I'm assuming you're here. I do not see her name on the attendance list. I didn't either. Nor do I see David Cook. Is anybody here from the L3?
So I am not going to try to speak to it on anyone's behalf. Um, so if we just want to take that down, Megan, if you don't mind, I'll send that um, by way of email to you guys with the guiding questions. And there may be something from um, that division that they might want to add on to a little bit. So if you guys could just look out for that and um, help them with some of their guiding questions that they had, that would be great. We don't meet again until March, which is crazy. Um, and then, so we just have three meetings left total. Um, so the 2023 meetings are March 9th, June 8th, and September 7th. And I believe Megan's already sent Zoom invites for all of those. Yes, team okay. invites, yes. Great. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping and then I'll see if anybody has anything and are we allowed to adjourn early? Yes, yes, you are. I did yes, just send a, a note to I know I sent a note to Sarah to see if she's uh, just running late or something, but you are allowed to adjourn early. <laughs> OK, <laughs> otherwise we can just talk to ourselves, I guess. So um, just a little bit of an update, and I do appreciate all of your all's patience and emails kind of back and forth as we were like settling into what we wanted this council to look like and the function of it. Um, we started off just kind of understanding like why we're each on this council and why we all believe in family partnership and being a little bit of a work group, thinking about problems of practice we wanted to change and challenges and started, started tackling those. We've shifted a little bit just because we don't meet that often. So it's really hard to work on a task when you meet six times over two years. Um, and it was a little tough to get people in between meetings. And so I spoke with Karen Dodd um, at the at the commissioner's office and also with Dr. Glass, just to clarify our purpose and role to the Department of Education, um, which is really to, to serve as almost a focus group is how I think about it. Um, so we're we're the feedback loop of family voice. And so um, the three presenters today are working on, on big initiatives through um, the Department of Ed, and they want to hear how families can be part of that and also how they're ensuring um, family partnership, family engagement, and family voice as they design and develop work. Uh, so in March, it'll be similar and that the department will let us know, hey, here's the things kind of coming down the pike before they go public or, or while they're kind of in their design phase. Um, we'd like some feedback from, from the Family Partnership Council. So I appreciate you all um, giving your opinions and if you would feel more comfortable or you're someone that needs to like look at things and process it and then you'll have more um, feedback and ideas, you can send those to me and then I can get the that feedback to those department um, heads because I'm one of those people that thinks out loud as I'm seeing it, but I know um, that most people like to sit with it, process it and then have something to say. So um, please feel free to look at everything that was presented today, dig a little bit on the KDE website, may, maybe even talk to families from your school or from your area, get their input um, and send me um, those ideas and I'll make sure they get to the right people. How do we um, access the links in this chat once we're not on this meeting anymore? Can we have those emailed in the minutes or you know how Megan usually sends us, here's what happened at the meeting. Can we have those links in there? This might speak to my ignorance with technology. I just don't know how to save those links. I think it's a great question. Um, no, I don't know about putting the links in the minutes. I know we can send them out in an email. I can, I can attempt to put them in the minutes. Well, an email would be fine too. I just didn't know. I, I want them in a place where I can go back and access them once I'm off this call, but I don't know how to do that. Yes, so I'll get I'll work with Megan and we will send those out to everyone in an email. Thank you. You're welcome. And then you all have the PowerPoint and the agenda with the guiding questions. So um, maybe just kind of going back to the information shared um, through the PowerPoint and the agenda. And Brooke, yeah. maybe I've missed something, but there's also an email communication from you regarding the Kentucky Collaborative Advisory Council meetings. 
Yes. Is, is this something that needs to be on our radar? So that is a separate advisory council. So um, you may be serving on both. Um, oh, I know what happened. Jennifer, I know what happened. That's where the where you were asking for the link. Okay. In the meeting Sorry. was live. And so I was halfway answering you and doing the meeting and I sent you. So I don't need to worry about that. Tuesday. Okay. No. Okay. Because I'm like. I didn't know I was on that council. <laughs> oh, geez. A couple okay. people are. I think Melissa's on both. Rhonda might be on both, and everyone's welcome to. If you're, if you're okay, because I'm like, uh, life, the final council I was aware of. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, you're fine. No, All I right. sent it to. You. I was trying to multitask. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, I don't feel like our meeting is complete until the cat runs behind you. I don't. I feel like I can't adjourn until we have a cat cameo. I was so embarrassed that Commissioner Glass <laughs> commented on that last time that she is banned from the room now. <laughs> my dog is at my feet, but my cat has been, she's not allowed in here. I even changed where I was meeting this time so that that wouldn't happen. I had no idea she was behind me until he mentioned that. I was so embarrassed. So funny. I had somebody that was listening to this live that was cracking up about it. So um, she's famous, catwalk famous. Um, is there anything um, just in these last couple minutes that you all want me to cover either through email? I don't mind to do work between meetings um, that you'd like to look into more or you somebody you want to be connected with um, and we can do that. Yes. Thank you, Lauren. Now we're complete, you guys. That came out. <laughs> um, so is there anything anybody would like to make sure that as a council we either book for March or I could send and or I could send information about it between meetings. I would love an update on the equity playbook and, and what they're doing with that, which come back and tell us how that's been going. OK, yeah, we'll make sure that um, in March there should be a lot of progress with that and probably more questions than hurdles. Any other items you guys would like to see addressed? Or updates on? Okay, well, um, if there's no more lingering questions or thoughts, then I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you Thank all. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thanks for your time, bye guys.